So right now I'm just checking out this slab that we have, ambrosia maple with a whole lot of burl. Um, we already have mold ready, about ready to do the pour. I'm trying to decide what type of pour we wanna do. Obviously we're gonna use thick set. Uh, based on the thickness here, two lifts should be able to do it. It's a little too thick for one lift, but I'm just trying to decide as far as pigmentation and color, which direction I wanna go because with all this burl, I don't really want to detract from it. I want to try to find a way to highlight the, all the grain and cool action going on here. Um, I was leaning towards maybe doing a mica at first, but now that I'm here, I don't really want to go with a mica-based pigment because with all of the you know waviness and effects that come with that, I think that's going to detract from the burl instead of highlighting it. So definitely a solid color. Just trying to decide if we want to do color or maybe just stick with something hazy to make it pop and then we'll uh, get to a pour. I'm gonna check out both sides here. I mean, we did have one side set as top, but that doesn't mean we're stuck to it being the top. On both sides, we have a lot of burl action, but on this side, the ambrosia is really coming through the maple a lot more. <clears throat> so just depending on if you have good taste or bad taste, this side might be more pretty or uglier. But one of the things I'm considering, since we're gonna do a deep pour, I think, having this as the top is probably going to work better just the way that the sides are sloped because we're going to have less issues with air getting trapped and then bubbles coming out and obviously with the deep pour bubbles are a large concern because no one likes bubbles in the epoxy Our molds all set. We have something propped under each corner to make leveling easy. This table is actually really level. You can see we just have some construction paper we're using as a shim and I had to shim two corners, um, which as you can see, it's not very much, very slight. I mean, we're talking 16th, 32nd of an inch. And on the level, it was just noticeable the difference. And that might seem like really splitting hairs, you know, adding this much of a shim, but on this kind of pour, we're doing the top up. So every extra few seconds that you spend leveling the mold is gonna save a whole lot of time in sanding later. later. So I'd rather take the time to get it as dead flat as possible because the resin is going to self-level than be close enough and spend a whole lot of time making dust. That's where we were. And then with the shim, very slight, but that can you know be the difference between another half hour of sanding. Another thing to note about how we have this mold elevator, we're doing a thick set pour with all epoxy the big thing we're really chasing is the exothermic reaction, which is making sure that it doesn't get too hot, too fast, and then just turn into a hot mess. One of the ways that we can minimize the chance of that happening is making sure it can stay cool. If we just had this heavy three quarter inch melamine mold on top of this three quarter inch bench, we can't get any airflow underneath it. So when we elevated this, we're making sure to just catch the corners just as much as needed to get the mold up so that we have lots of airflow underneath. It's gonna help keep the whole thing cool so our slab is about inch and a quarter inch thick um, in my experience in my climate i can do thick set at about three quarters of an inch from what i've heard in this climate about half inch is the max we're going to cheat try to go about five eighths so two five eighths inch lifts should get us there and then there's this balancing act with any deep pour epoxy where the thicker you go the faster it's going to set and cure if you go too thin then you're going to push to you know the outer limits of what you see on that label of it taking 72 hours to fully cure if you go thicker you're not going to get there um, or you're going to get there a lot faster so we want to go as thick as we can so we can recoat quickly but without going so thick that it kicks off and turns into a hot mess okay we're ready to mix up some Thick set, it's a three to one mix. So on my big bucket here, down the three to one side, this makes keeping your ratios really easy. If you don't have any cool buckets, um, use a scale is normally the best way, but the markings on this are pretty good. So I trust this. And also remember the larger volume you're doing, the bigger forgiveness you have in nailing your ratio. If you're doing really small amounts, always break out the scale, make sure you get it right. So we're just going to uh, fill up to our lines. <clears throat> Paddle mixer always makes mixing epoxy a whole lot easier. Just remember, um, if you wanna mix in a lot of air bubbles, go fast. If you want less air bubbles, go slower. And this right here is why I like to add my pigment after I mix the epoxy. You can see you know, all the striations where it's not mixed yet. Once it's really clear, I'll know it's good and mixed. If you mix your color in now, it's really hard to see that. 
but this is another good way to tell when your epoxy's mixed well. So we're all ready to pour. We have about a gallon mixed up. Now I actually did a video on lots of different ways to calculate your volume. If you're trying to really nail the percentage, generally what I do is just mix more than I think, especially on a weird shape like this, where it's gonna be a little more challenging to calculate, which is also handy if you're somewhere that epoxy is free. Yeah, there's a little cavity here that I saw didn't get any epoxy, so I wanna make sure that doesn't get too thick when we do the next pour and it all finally goes in there. So we're here with Caleb from You Can Make This Too, all the way from Mississippi. And uh, we're so excited to have him because we have the other half of the slab that we started working on with Jess. So we cut it in half, we did a little uh, layered painting and epoxy work with Jess, and now we have Caleb here to work his thick set magic. Different epoxy, different style, same slab. So what are you up to here, Caleb? Well, we decided which side we want to be the top, which is on top. Got this in the mold, which you guys were kind enough to have everything prepped so we can get this done in time. Speaking of time, it's already poured because uh, we need time to get this to cure so we can get the second layer on. And we're just gonna encapsulate this thing in some epoxy, not fully encapsulate, fill it out to a nice rectangle, make a steel base for it later, and uh, hopefully it looks good. So far it's looking good. It looks good already, yeah. you're right. And these guys had gone ahead and I know they sealed uh, the edges for you, I think they use one of the faster epoxies mm -hmm. and uh, that certainly will save us some time here. So let this cure and then get this done in two pours, you think? Yep, two pours should do it. Um, so it's early in the morning, we got the first pour done. The goal is hopefully at five eighths of an inch thick. This is thick enough that before we wrap up for the day, we can do the second lift so that way tomorrow it can cure and give us time to then demold it the following day and start finishing it. The race is on. The race is on. All right, thanks for coming. We're psyched to have you and yeah. let's keep going. Yeah, let's do it. So while the epoxy is in there curing, we're gonna start working on the base, but we need to do some uh, technical drawings first. This is the top. The rough concept for the base is something. Like that. It's very elegant and simple. So to take it up a notch from an end view, it's actually gonna look like this. So we have a lot of compound angles we're gonna be cutting on the steel. Now the steel saw we're using only cuts simple angles, not compound angles. So we're gonna make a wedge that we can use to cut the compound angles. As we increase the angle to do some of the other pieces, things got a little weird. And by increasing the angle, the clamps were no longer hitting the metal. So we had to jig it up a few ways, which also means um, the saw itself is probably gonna start hitting our fixturing jig before we make the cut, kind of like it did on the other pieces. I don't think it's gonna make it quite as far, but we're gonna go ahead and cut, see how far we can make, because the more we can do with this, it'll get us a good baseline to then just finish a cut instead of having to fully freehand mark all these compound angles.
So after we finish the pour, we put some covering on this just to help keep dust. You'll notice that it's nice and tinted for airflow, help keep it from having a runaway exothermic reaction, but we're ready to uncover it and do the next pour. Now, we know it's ready for the next pour because we've been monitoring the temperature of it. It peaked at about 106 degrees around two hours ago or so. We've been checking it and it's dropped to 95 now. When epoxy cures, it does kind of have a peak. Once it hits that peak and it crests and it starts coming back down, it won't go back up and you're safe to pour. And the final check is we can kind of tap it and you can even hear it. So we definitely have gone past the gummy and gel stage and it's kind of solid. So we're ready to go ahead and pour it. Now, if, and in some areas it is a touch gummy, which is fine, sort of the bigger pour area. It's kicked off more closer to the edges and the smaller areas still a little gummy, but we've already peaked in crest, so we're good to go ahead and pour. It's time to mix up more. When we did the pour earlier, it was right around just under half, so we mixed extra to make sure we wouldn't run low. Now, I ended up having about, an, we did pour in or take away from the extra, but I still had about an inch and a half, and if we left it in here, that definitely would have had a runaway reaction and gone nuts. Since we had some extra buckets that are scrap anyways, I poured it out even, so these will just cure naturally on their own, then we can safely throw them away. Don't have to worry about anything crazy happening with this while we're out of the shop. Once again, using clean buckets to pour, just to make sure we don't have any unmixed epoxy. Since I did mix it in two buckets, the color ratio might not have been perfect. It looked really similar, but that's why I mixed as much as I could together. And then two buckets, try to keep everything equal. That way when we do the pour, we don't have any color variation going on. So time to go dump these. So it's the next morning. Uh, last night we found this piece of poly, got it all cleaned off so that way we wouldn't drop melamine dust into the finish again. So time to take it off and make sure everything cured well last night. And it mostly did. Um, it is hard. I was talking about writing that line of thickness. You wanna get thick enough that it cures quickly but not go exo and not be so thin that it takes forever to cure. And it looks like we just barely had a, a runaway exo reaction. Everything's fine. Um, it did sink a little bit. So we're gonna need one more pour, but we didn't ruin anything. So because we're only looking at about a 16th to an eighth of an inch that we sunk and that we need a top coat, I do not wanna use thick set. We could use thick set, but it's gonna take a solid three days for a coat that thin to dry. And I'm gonna be home before then. So what we're gonna do is probably use, uh, we could either use high performance and degas it in a vacuum chamber to get rid of the bubbles and pour that, which would settle in time. But instead of that, I think we're going to use some tabletop because it also self levels really nicely and tends to release bubbles a little bit better. So we'll mix up some tabletop epoxy, do a pour and that'll be sandable tonight. So tomorrow we can uh, demold this, sand that, stay on time. Now we can tell that it just barely started to have a runaway but didn't fully run away because in this larger section here, it's kind of ripply, you can feel it. And then looking through, I can see all the light waves kind of really looks like an ocean on the bottom there as the curves are refracting the light. And then right over here in this little bay thing, it definitely like bubbled up and scooped down and everything. So this little spot here is the only place it kind of really started to run away, but that's, that's really small. We can sand that out once we top coat it, we'll be good. So remember last night we had 
a whole bunch of leftover epoxy and I poured it out among those three buckets to make sure after we left the shop, we didn't have epoxy bubbling all over the floor, making a huge mess. Turned into a pretty cool teachable moment. This was the thinnest pour and it's super gummy. We couldn't get this out at all. These other two were a little bit thicker. This one's kind of in between and it's still really soft and very indentable. But this was from a mixing bucket and you can see on the bottom, there's all these super unmixed bits that just didn't cure at all. Whereas this is what was left from the bucket that we poured into to pour out of. And it's was a little bit thicker, so it's already perfectly cured, um, very firm and also fully cured. We don't have any of those sticky undone bits like we do on here. So just to highlight the importance of not pouring out of your mixing bucket, because you're going to end up with all, all this stuff in your pour. It's not going to cure. And also just the difference of the, the slightest difference in thickness and how that affects your cure time because we've only got about an eighth of an inch difference here and that's between you know definitely not sandable to sandable to another eighth of an inch less and you know we can't even demold this thing Had a few issues with all these crazy angles, but we finally have everything ground down to where they need to be. Um, using the table as a reference, pulled some measurements, everything is where it needs to be. So we tack this together, get the other leg, set it on top, tack it together, weld it all, and then do some more grinding, I guess. Gotta grind welds. Won't be as bad as grinding angles though. So let's get to it. So you notice I did a couple tacks just to hold everything where it needs to be. And then I did these low little kind of stitch welds, which might seem weird because I'm going to weld the whole thing. Well, welding is a process of fusing metal together using heat from electricity, turns it into a molten state and then it cools. Well, as we know, things that are warm expand, things that when they cool, they contract. So you have to be really careful when you weld, if you want to keep things in the place you put them. If I ran a whole bead on one side, when that contracted, it would actually be square and then pull itself out of square. So doing these short stitch welds with is, was just enough heat that with the tacks, things aren't gonna move. And then I could stitch both sides. So now when I come back and do a full weld, there's something on that other side to keep it from moving, even though it's gonna try to contract. So if you don't have fixtures and clamps strong enough to lock everything in place when you weld, always think through your welding process to make sure things stay where you want them to.
So this plate is what we're going to use to actually attach the legs to the bottom of the tabletop. Um, to keep everything lined up and centered, I just made an offset line so I can make sure that the front of this is where it needs to be. And then a center line, because both of these legs are going to be kind of smushed right against each other in the middle to get to the right width. So that gives us some more to lay it out. I'm going to get an extra set of hands to hold this in place, do a few tacks, and then weld it on down. So what I've been doing is with it flipped over, finding the point where it touches that it's rocking on, and I'm grinding them down to get flatter, which is also lowering my two tall legs until I get engagement on all four legs. And on the back legs, what that also is gonna do is give me a sharpened point I can use as a weapon to stab someone and escape this hell hole. We have yet another epoxy reveal. I don't know how many times we're gonna do that this project. But yes, the tabletop epoxy has cured, filled in that little bit of sunkenness we had because I should have domed it just a little bit, but then it also did go a little exo on the big area. <clears throat> so everything worked out great. Next, we'll just be demolding this. Then we're gonna throw it on the CNC, do a very light skim pass, just remove a lot of this tabletop epoxy. And then, um, Square it up, sand, put some finish on it. Then we'll have a tabletop. Um, base is just about done too. Um, <clears throat> one of the things we're gonna be very careful of when we flatten this is to try to keep it just proud of the wood so we'll have a little bit of sanding. One of the things we definitely don't wanna do is touch any of that thick set when we flatten because since it did go just a little bit XO whenever epoxy goes XO and you try to machine it, it tends to shatter and kind of explode. It doesn't cut nicely. So we definitely don't wanna do that. Otherwise we're gonna have a bunch of chip out and stuff. Just big tip for flattening epoxy. So yeah, let's uh, take this thing apart. So we flattened everything on the CNC and then we trimmed it to size using the table saw and track saw just to clean up all the edges. Then you saw us go through the fantastic sanding process. It went up to 600 grit on the top and sides. It went up to 220 on the bottom. The reason we sanded the bottom, since we used that melamine form, there was a little bit of a texture added, which isn't gonna give as much light transmission so it wouldn't be as clear. So that 220 just helped get rid of some of that texture. So once we get this halcyon on it, That'll fill any micro scratches. We don't have to worry about doing a full polish on this. One of the things though is I don't want to yellow this beautiful blue tint at all and make it green, but I do want to tone the wood. The way I'm going to do that is using Total Boat Amber Halcyon in gloss, but this is a really thick finish because it self levels, which is a great quality. 
but that kind of fights against me. You don't want to treat this like a wipe on, wipe off kind of varnish at all. It's just not going to go well. But since it's water-based, what I'm doing is mixing it about equal parts water and finish to turn it into more of a penetrating finish that now I can wipe onto the wood. It'll soak into the wood and you can see the nice tone that it's adding. But if I get any on the epoxy, because the epoxy is non-porous, I'm gonna come back and wipe that off. Yeah, and the nice thing is we don't have to be super delicate about applying this. You see I'm kind of ham-fisted here, but since we're gonna wipe off all the excess anyways, I'm not worried about brush strokes or any of that. Now step one's done, we're gonna do the next coat, which is a clear gloss in Halcyon. I wanna ultimately finish this in satin, but we're gonna build a few coats in gloss first because gloss is the purest version of any finish. The way you achieve any sheen other than gloss is by adding flatteners, which basically serve to muddy the finish and minimize how much light is reflected. So if we build all the coats with satin, it's not gonna be as crisp as if we start with gloss and only top coat with satin. So. And the nice thing about using the super diluted mix is we don't really have a dry time um, and we can just go right over all the uh, amber we just put on. Base is wrapped up, now we just need to put a finish so it doesn't start rusting or keep rusting. So what we're gonna do is a really fast finish. We're gonna hit, hit it with a torch to pull all the moisture out of the surface. Um, we'll try to get it on camera. You can kind of see the gradient as the torch goes and you can see when it's ready while it's still hot. We're gonna wipe paste wax on it so it just melts into it, self levels, provides a nice film. And then when it dries, we have a very fast light duty finish, perfect for a coffee table that isn't gonna be in the elements or have a whole lot of abrasion, rubbing, touching. So nothing's really gonna be wearing the finish down. So it's great for light duty purposes. So it's a new day, tell, got a new shirt on. So one of the nice things about Halcyon is you do not have to sand between coats at all. However, for the best flattest finish, not sheen wise, but smoothness, um, you do want to sand before your last coat, which is one of the things I like to do. So it came in the 400 grit, kind of smoothed out the previous coats that we brushed on, got the sprayer out. We sprayed on one coat of satin to knock the sheen down from a gloss to a satin. And we're just gonna let this dry, make sure we got even coverage, touch it up if we need to do a little bit on the bottom and the base is ready. So once the finish, the Halcyon's all dried up, we can screw them together and the two become one and we're all done. So we sprayed on two coats of Total Boat Halcyon Satin to mute the finish after we sanded it. Those have both laid down and dried beautifully. The only thing left is attached these together. So you saw we drilled some holes, put in some quarter 20 inserts, and then bolted it together. 
and it's all done. Now, one of the cool things I don't think we've mentioned before is this slab is actually part of a larger slab, the other end of which is over here that Jess Crow came and did a few weeks ago. And we're about to give her a call. She actually hasn't got to see this totally finished yet with the legs on it and everything. So we're gonna give her a call, let her see her finish table, see my finish table, and we're gonna chat about them. Yeah, it's it's such a tactile experience, and just and I think that's a sign of a good piece too. And, and my sort of capstone whenever I build anything or go to a show or take it to a client, if the first thing they do is walk up and touch it, it's like okay, we won. Yeah. But yeah. Anyway, thanks for all the feedback, Jess. I really appreciate it. Again, great job on the table. Thanks for hopping on a call, taking a little pause from work, and hopefully we can meet up at one of these meetups for too long.